Welcome again to the Murphy Institute series of faculty webinars. My name is Greg Sisk, a co-director of the Murphy Institute. This is the fourth in a series to highlight our University of St. Thomas faculty and the mission-related work they are doing. In addition to more formal conferences, this faculty series will continue throughout the academic year with diverse members of our university faculty addressing such issues as religious liberty, racism and public health, racial equity, and police brutality. Our speakers each talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we will invite your questions. The question and answer link on your Zoom page is the way to send questions to me as the host, and then I will choose as many of the most common questions as possible before we can conclude in about an hour. Six weeks ago, the Supreme Court issued a landmark decision prohibiting states from discriminating against religious organizations, including schools, when offering tax credits. That majority opinion cited repeatedly to a book co-authored by today's speaker. Thomas Berg is the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of St. Thomas. In addition to a JD from the University of Chicago, Professor Berg received an MA in Religious Studies there. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. He is one of the leading scholars in America on religious liberty, authoring several books, including the, lead, including the leading casebook titled Religion and the Constitution, and a book titled The State and Religion, along with more than 50 book chapters and law reviews, articles. He is a well-known advocate in the courts and legislatures on behalf of religious liberty. He heads the Religious Liberty Clinic at the University of St. Thomas, in which he supervises students in writing briefs in major religious liberty cases, including recently in four cases before the Supreme Court. And not incidentally, he is a former co-director of the Murphy Institute. Welcome, Professor Berg. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to you and David and Michelle at the Murphy Institute for inviting me to do this and for uh, Michelle and uh, Xander Moser for the uh, logistical help. So let me share my screen here and we'll get started on this talk today. So my talk today is entitled Religious Freedom Amid the Tumult. Uh, I'm very happy to be as here as part of the series on uh, the common good in uncommon times. Uh, and the topic today, religious freedom, is a right of all persons that is indeed vital to the common good for reasons that I'll try to touch on today. This was a landmark Supreme Court term for religious freedom. The court decided six cases double or triple the usual number. Uh, and it decided them arising in multiple contexts. These decisions also came at a time of extraordinary stress and turbulence in society. And they relate in striking ways to those forces of turbulence. So I'm going to discuss religious freedom as it relates to three P words of our current turbulence. Pandemic, polarization of culture and politics, and protests over racial injustice. I have two aims today. Uh, first is to explain the court's approach to religious freedom in several, not all of these terms, uh, this term's cases. And I can only touch on, on these, I'm happy to talk in more detail in the Q&A. But the second goal is to draw some lessons about how to ref defend religious freedom today as a vital aspect of human dignity along with other rights and interests. So let's begin with pandemic. And in particular, the prominent issue concerning bans and limitations on in-person worship services under public health orders to slow the transmission 
of COVID-19. In the early weeks of the pandemic, many states and localities banned gatherings of more than 10 people, including for religious worship. These strict, strict rules were uh, relaxed as states and cities uh, opened up, uh, as they say, uh, but many places still have some limits on worship services along with other mass gatherings, limiting, it to, limiting them to a certain absolute number of people or a percent of room capacity. Most congregations around the nation complied with these orders or even closed voluntarily, but some have not and a few have even challenged the restrictions legally. Uh, these restrictions create extraordinary burdens on the free exercise of religion, unusual burdens, especially when they last for several months. But of course, the interests on the other side are extraordinary too. Public health in a pandemic is perhaps the epitome of a compelling governmental justification for a restriction. And in-person worship service do present, uh, worship services do present uh, elevated risks of transmission. Several have been documented as uh, super spreaders of infection uh, without, at least without uh, uh, strict social distancing uh, uh, engaged in, uh, in them. But there's one more key fact in analyzing these cases, and that is that public health orders have always permitted some activities involving more than 10 people in, in, a, in a place. Even the strict shutdowns of March and April still permitted grocery stores, restaurant takeout services, transportation centers, medical services, so-called essential manufacturing facilities, and others. Later, states began uh, their phased reopenings, increasingly permitting more activities from retail shopping to uh, in restaurant dining to hair salons and nail salons. Many states also uh, relaxed their restrictions on worship at that time, uh, although they often did uh, set that for a later stage of reopening. If a state or city permits other activities while banning religious worship, that can have two legal consequences arising from the two different rules that potentially govern religious freedom cases around the country. In close to 35 states, constitutional provisions or statutes are protective of religion and provide that any substantial burden on religious exercise must be necessary to serving a compelling state interest. And when the state allows other activities that present similar risks to religious worship, then that tends to undercut the government's argument that its interest is compelling. Uh, that strict standard doesn't apply in the other 15 or so states, 15 or a little bit more. They are governed simply by the US Constitution's free exercise clause. Under that, the Supreme Court has ruled that a burden on religion, however severe, doesn't have to serve a strong state interest if the law in question is neutral and generally applicable. That's the phrase. Thus, the court said in a famous case called Smith, uh, Employment Division versus Smith, that a state could apply a general law criminalizing peyote use to Native American worshipers who ingest peyote as a sacrament. There's no need to show that the prohibition was necessary in the religious context. But if a state sheltering order allows a significant number of other activities presenting similar risks as worship, then there's an argument that it flunks the requirement of neutrality and general applicability. Now that test has an ambiguity uh, and one the Supreme Court has not fully resolved. Does a law flunk general applicability 
only when it singles out or targets religion alone among all activities. That kind of law would likely reflect state hostility towards religion, aiming at it, targeting it. Or is it enough that the law treats religion worse than some other comparable activities, even if not all, but some other comparable activities? And in that case, even if that doesn't reflect hostility towards religion because it's not singling it out, it could reflect a devaluing of religion by treating it less at, as less important than uh, other uh, activities or some significant number of other activities. Now, I believe that devaluing religion does violate the Constitution even in the absence of outright hostility. And uh, so let me just say a little bit about that. The constitutional text tells us that uh, religion is an explicit right. The premise of that, I think, is that the ability to engage in voluntary religious practice should be valued highly. It's, in fact, very important to its adherence as well. And that is the premise of treating religion as a constitutional right, the exercise of religion. That may be especially true in the stress of a pandemic. Uh, multiple studies tell us that voluntary religious practice by individuals increases their morale, reduces their fears, and also in a social way, uh, encourages giving time and money to others in service activities and that it has other psychological benefits. But the sociologists tell us that virtually all of these effects come not from simply believing individually in religion. It's not simply religious belief. It is the participation in religious social support networks, attending services, meeting with friends there, uh, at services and in small groups. So in-person bans threaten to restrict several aspects of religious exercise that actually make it the most vital to adherence. What conclusion should we draw from all this? On the one hand, many of the public health orders have had a questionable feature in that they designated various activities as quote unquote essential or essential services allowing more persons in a given space, grocery, food takeout, banks, healthcare, but also less obviously vital uh, services like accountants offices. But then they omitted in-person worship from that list. They placed religion, uh, worship services in the different and more restricted category of so-called mass gatherings, along with concerts, theater, and sporting events. That threatens indeed to devalue religious exercise, suggesting that it's another entertainment or hobby rather than a fundamental right of persons. States cannot place worship in a more restricted category because they deem it non-essential. That's the proposition that ought to come out of religion as a fundamental right. Now, however, they might place it in a more elevated, in a more restricted category because it creates elevated risks of transmission. And that's the distinction that matters uh, here. In early June, the Supreme Court, by a five to four vote in a case called South Bay Pentecostal Church, rejected a church's effort to obtain an emergency injunction that would allow it to uh, exceed a 25% room capacity in its worship service on Pentecost Sunday. The court denied the request, the church's request for an injunction. 
Chief Justice Roberts was the only one of the five who denied the request to write an opinion. Uh, he uh, concluded in that opinion that the state could restrict worship more than it restricted retail shopping and offices because there's a difference in the, L in the levels of risk. In worship, large groups of people gather in close proximity for extended periods of time. Uh, worship has other features that m might gener uh, justify putting it in the more restricted categories. It can involve physical hugs, the sharing of sacraments or hymnals, uh, and singing, which uh, has also been shown to, to spread droplets uh, further, respiratory droplets. Roberts added a second point in his opinion, and that is the court should be reluctant to question public health orders because the issue of exactly when to restrict, uh, relax restrictions on uh, in the throes of a pandemic is, as he called it, a dynamic, in fact, intensive question. The executive branch has both more expertise and more accountability than judges do. But two weeks ago, late July, the same five to four court denied an injunction to a church in a much more troubling case. This one brought by Calvary Chapel near Reno, Nevada. Nevada's order at that stage of reopening limited worship to 50 persons, but allowed potentially far more people, up to 50% of room capacity in restaurants, bars, gyms, bowling alleys, and no surprise, casinos. And there's the Riviera logo over on the left. The idea that Las Vegas casinos or Reno casinos might be safer than churches is hard to swallow, as Justice Alito put it in his dissent in this case. As he observed, 50% capacity in casinos often means thousands of patrons with far less physical distancing and other safety measures than in most worship services. Since patrons often come from around the nation, they frequent multiple tables and multiple casinos, they crowd around the tables, and they drink alcohol. Bars, gyms, and indoor restaurants, which Nevada also permitted, uh, also pose elevated risks. So quite a few things allowed that create the same sort of elevated risks as uh, worship might, or even worse. Alito raised a second point in this late July opinion. By that time, worship had been restricted four months, during which officials could have developed more considered and even-handed regulations. They should not get, he said, carte blanche for however long the medical problem persists. Now this time the Chief Justice did not explain his decisive vote. Uh, John Roberts did not explain his decisive vote. He seems committed to deferring to elected officials throughout the pandemic. And if the spikes in new cases that are happening around the country and might happen in the fall return us to 10 person limits that effectively ban in person worship, I expect that um, Roberts will provide the fifth vote to defer uh, in those cases as well. But in the Nevada case, the four dissenters were right. The state had devalued religion. Courts should give uh, deference to the expertise and accountability of executive officials, but they can still do that and strike down clear cases of devaluing religion. As Justice Gorsuch observed, it seemed clear that in Nevada, it was, quote, better to be in entertainment than it was to be in religion. The state may value the jobs and revenue that casinos and bowling produce but it can't value the constitutional right of worship less. The pandemic touches on another religious freedom issue in this term's cases, and that is whether government funding can include religious organizations among its beneficiaries. The Federal Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, 
gives loans to businesses and nonprofit organizations during the economic crisis caused by COVID shutdowns. If they keep their workers on payroll, their loan is forgiven, effectively becoming a grant. Religious nonprofits are eligible, including houses of worship. And as a result, PPP loans are paying the salaries of clergy, which has raised objections from a, some organizations promoting church state separation. The ba uh, some background to this. The Supreme Court's doctrine on government funding of religious organizations has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. In the 1970s and 80s, the court frequently held that programs that aided private K-12 schooling violated the Establishment Clause because they provided substantial aid to religious schools. But this no aid rule, which is premised on a broad understanding of separation of church and state, has given way since the 1990s to an approach that emphasizes equal treatment of religion and respect for families' private choice to use religious schools, among other options. The court held in 2002 that the Establishment Clause did not require the states to exclude religious schools from neutrally designed voucher programs where the money followed the family's choice. Now that left open a question whether the state had discretion to exclude religious schools if it wanted to. Uh, in order to pursue this no aid stricter separation? Or is the state actually forbidden to single out religious organizations for exclusion? In two recent decisions, the court has forbidden the state to exclude entities just because they are religious. If a state gives aid to private organizations for a secular purpose, it must not discriminate against otherwise qualified organizations because of their religious character. In the latest decision, which uh, Greg mentioned, uh, Espinoza uh, rendered this June, Montana gave a tax credit to individuals who donated money to private organizations that in turn funded tuition for low income students in private schools whether the schools were non-religious or religious. Montana's Supreme Court invalidated that uh, program based on a state constitutional provision that forbade any state aid to religious schools, however indirect and attenuated as this aid was. As you can see the arrows up there in the, in the slide, several steps between the Montana tax credit and the actual use of money by individuals at religious schools. The US Supreme Court reversed it uh, by five to four. It held that, that the Montana courts rule uh, violated the free exercise clause by discriminating against religious schools and the families that chose them. The Espinoza decision solidifies the constitutional norm of respecting people's choice of religious providers and treating those choices equally. Now, the inclusion of clergy and houses of worship in PPP loans fares pretty well under this approach of equal treatment and uh, provider choice. Since the PPP law itself includes houses of worship, the issue is not whether the law has to include them, but whether the federal government has discretion to do so. And remember, it's now been more than 20 years that the, since the court has decisively rejected establishment clause limits on including religious providers on an equal basis. And while funding of clergy 
uh, directly clergy salaries is a pretty exceptional thing in our tradition. Since the early 1800s, we've generally kept government out of that activity. Our circumstances today are exceptional. That's the point. Government orders shut down the economy for uh, legitimate, understandable, even compelling reasons. But to neutralize that, the government then is trying to keep individuals and entities on their feet, help them stay on their feet, a policy that certainly serves, uh, also serves a legitimate public purpose. All right, there's the first P, pandemic. What about the second P, polarization? Even before the pandemic, America was under stress. We are more polarized now than at any time in the last 60 years. Social scientists tell us that that polarization has become especially dangerous because it's negative in nature. That is, each side focuses more on thwarting its opponents than on advancing a positive vision of its own. And it's also effective, not EFF, but AFF, effective, meaning that each side detests not only the other side's political views, but also its religion, its music, its neighborhood living patterns, and other cultural elements. Uh, among the drivers of polarization are disputes over religious freedom, especially in conflicts with non-discrimination laws. As LGBT people gain equal treatment in marriage, employment, and other fields, conservative Christians fear that equal treatment claims will harm their organizations. Catholic adoption agencies may be forced to certify same-sex households and place children with them. In 2016, conservative religious colleges in California with policies against same-sex or transgender conduct nearly lost their state, uh, state aid uh, provided to their low-income students. In that year's election, studies show religious liberty fears helped drive up conservative Christian support for Donald Trump. Now, religious freedom in the West, in Europe and America, arose to counteract fear and murderous conflict between Protestants and Catholics. Fear of the other side likewise drives today's milder but still dangerous divisions. Religious freedom, like other important freedoms, can mitigate polarization by calming fear, by assuring each side that they can live according to their deep beliefs without facing penalties for doing so. The right solution here is to protect both LGBT people and religious conservatives. LGP not, uh, to pass non, uh, LGP non LGBT non-discrimination laws along with meaningful religious exemptions for uh, objecting organizations and individuals. It is possible to give substantial protection to both sides if we draw careful lines. Uh, in theory, the two sides might have reached such a bargain uh, by statute with each gaining something important, but polarization in society and in legislatures has blocked any such deal. This term, the Supreme Court changed the situation dramatically. It, first in Bostock v. Clayton County, the court held that discrimination against LGBT persons uh, is already illegal under Title VII's prohibition on sex discrimination. In one swoop, LGBT rights proponents achieved many of the protections that they wanted nationwide. Now in any bargaining, uh, religious conservatives leverage is greatly reduced. So if there will be corresponding religious freedom protections, it's up to the court also to declare those drawing on existing laws if we're not gonna have new legislation. 
Justice Gorsuch's, Gorsuch's majority opinion in Bostock appeared to embrace that task, saying that the court was deeply concerned with preserving the free exercise of religion, which lies at the heart of our pluralistic society. Because there was no religious liberty issue raised before the court in any of the cases, the court put off the issue until later cases, but it did list several possible sources of protection, including a religious organization exemption in Title VII itself, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, fondly known as RIFRA, and finally, the so-called ministerial exemption, which bars the application of non-discrimination laws to claims by ministers against their religious employers. That exception, which was unanimous, unanimously endorsed by the court in 2012, uh, in a, a case called Hosanna Tabor, rests on the premise that discrimination suits by ministers, quote, interfere with the internal governance of the church depriving it of control over the selection who, of those who teach and personify its beliefs. Now, within two weeks after Bostock then, at the end of the term, the court began to deliver on these suggestions. In two cases, Morrissey, Beru, and Beale, the court, it held, the court held that the ministerial exception applied to two suits by teachers in Catholic schools who taught fifth grade classes, but also taught religion classes setting forth Catholic doctrine. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals had held that these teachers could proceed with their suits because they fell outside the category of minister. And that was because they lacked a formal ministerial title or ministerial type training. Supreme Court, however, uh, reversed and said the teachers fell within the exception because what matters is what the employee does. And these teachers ed educated young people in their faith and that lies at the very core of the mission of a private religious school. It's an important decision. It's um, uh, not clear exactly how far this protection will extend. Does the exception cover teachers who don't teach doctrine, religious doctrine classes, but are encouraged to integrate religious in insights into their English or history classes? Is it enough that, as many schools say, teachers even if they don't have to be explicit about religion in class, religious doctrine in class, are, should act as role models of the faith for their students. What about other employees besides teachers? Now, the, the, uh, so there are all these open questions about the ministerial exception. The other protections that the court mentioned are likewise potentially significant, but they also have uncertainties. The Title VII exception allows religious organizations to prefer individuals of a particular religion in employment, which courts have confirmed includes preferring individuals who adhere to religiously based standards of employee conduct. There's some debate though, whether this provision protects only against claims of religious discrimination, not claims of sex discrimination. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act is potentially broad. It provides that burdens on religion must serve a compelling governmental interest, a strict standard as we've already seen. But there's some debate about whether that statute applies in suits brought by private parties, such as individuals claiming discrimination. Despite these uncertainties, the court seems to have undertaken the task of protecting traditional uh, people of faith who object, uh, as well as protecting LGBT plaintiffs. Aiming at a kind of true pluralism where there's room for both groups to, to have substantial freedom in uh, society. Courts aren't ideal for that balancing task, but they're better than nothing. 
Now, Judge Learned Hand made a famous warning that uh, a society, in the, to quote him, a society that is so riven that the spirit of moderation is gone, no court can save. Let's hope that he was wrong about that, given the way in which our society is riven now. But even if courts do declare religious liberty rights corresponding to LGBT non-discrimination rights, it will take years of litigation for the contours of that to work out. In today's third wave of turbulence, Americans are confronting racial injustice in the wake of the Minneapolis police killing of George Floyd. With that subject so prominent in public debate, what are the connections between racial justice and religious liberty? I'd answer by that by reiterating first that religious liberty must be treated as essential, but also that protecting religious liberty also fits with and indeed calls for prioritizing racial justice as well. Let me explain that a little further. Religious freedom uh, and, uh, sorry, racial equality and religious freedom uh, can come in conflict, but those cases are unusual. They don't reflect a fundamental disconnect between the two rights. We must acknowledge that white Christians over the years have made religious liberty arguments, losing arguments in the end to maintain slavery and segregation. Bob Jones University, a fundamentalist college lost its federal tax exemption because it prohibited interracial dating by students and the Supreme Court upheld that withdrawal. Religious freedom and racial equality can also unfortunately be put in competition with each other. The protest against police killings broke out during COVID related shutdowns. And some critics complained that the protests violated the mass gathering prohibitions that were still in place. Churches began to point to the protests as yet another activity governments were permitting, reinforcing the argument that shutdown orders were not generally applicable and that they were de devaluing religion compared with other risky activities. Sadly, at least one government uh, official, prominent official, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio gave impetus to this charge of devaluing. Early on, de Blasio closed houses of worship and threatened sanctions against Orthodox Jewish mourners at a mass outdoor funeral. But then later he defended the rights of racial justice protesters saying, when you see a nation simultaneously grappling with an extraordinary crisis seated in 400 years of American racism, I'm sorry, that's not the same question as the understandably aggrieved store owner or the devout religious person who wants to go back to services. Now, de Blasio was correct about the importance of Black Lives Matter protests. And he could have made a distinction based on relative risks, as I've already suggested. I could say the protests were outdoors, unlike many worship services. Instead, de Blasio gave a textbook example of devaluing the importance of religion. Such devaluing helps solidify polarization. Uh, white conser uh, social conservatives who are dispor disproportionately religious already include some who are skeptical about the urgency of the need for change or fundamental change to achieve racial justice. I think they're wrong in that skepticism, but they are justified in resenting the dismissiveness that progressives show them. That resentment stiffens the resolve to fight all progressive initiatives. And that's the cycle of negative, effective polarization. Resentment of the other side overwhelms whatever inclination people might have had to solve problems together. But in turn, 
when white social, uh, religious conservatives, as they sometimes do, dismiss the urgency of racial justice, they undercut support for their own deepest concerns like religious liberty. In particular, they discourage the black church from becoming a vocal supporter of religious liberty claims in current debates. In a contribution to a 2019 symposium here at St. Thomas, Harvard sociologist Jacqueline Rivers, an expert on the black church and herself a social conservative, describes this cost in stark terms. She writes, the support of the black church, which represents irrefutable victims of hateful prejudice, could do much to silence the charge that religious freedom claims are a thin disguise for discriminatory behavior. But the black church has been lukewarm about this overall, Rivers says, largely because the face of strenuous defense of religious freedom today has often been Southern white evangelicals, a demographic which blacks are loath to support and which, with which they refuse to collaborate. They refuse in part because of the quote that, uh, quoting Rivers again, the deep and enduring historical connections between white evangelicals and, and virulent racism, as well as the current day politics of white evangelicals, or at least many who have overwhelmingly supported the Republican Party and have been willing to accept and not call out the vulgar racially loaded rhetoric of Donald Trump. Again, quoting uh, Professor Rivers. In an article in Christianity Today, black Christian clergy echoed this diagnosis. A couple of examples of that, I'll just quote Texas Baptist leader, Catherine Freeman. Because religion was used as a uh, reason to exclude blacks from many facets of American life, blacks tend to be cautious and more focused on procuring their freedom from racial injustice than their religious freedom. Now, to be clear, this charge does not mean that white conservatives have to stop being Republicans, become Democrats, or agree with or adopt all progressive proposals on racial justice. But they do need to reject those who try to exploit racial grievance, white racial grievance, and they must confront, confront the costs of downplaying racial inequality or avoiding it as an issue. The tragedy and scandal that's divided Christians for decades, and now among many other things, erodes the credibility of religious freedom claims. The truth is, as Mike, law professor Michael Helfand has observed, that racial justice and religious liberty go hand in hand. Both are central norms in America's constitutional tradition, even if we've ignored both in fact too often. Religious liberty has also been a source of remarkable power for Americans of color. Jacqueline Rivers has joined, coined the term enacted religious freedom to describe how in the civil rights years, religious faith, biblical language and preaching, church-based energy and organization was the driving force that empowered the sacrifice and victory of the civil rights movement. Sociologists have also documented the immense importance of religious organizations in empowering and serving vulnerable people children, homeless, prisoners, the poor in African-American communities and elsewhere. These two, Jackie Rivers says, are examples of enacted religious freedom. Believers acting on deeply held religious beliefs. Religious liberty creates the space for these organizations to do their work and to maintain the identity that inspires them. So let me sum up. Among many lessons from today's crises is that religious practice, when freely chosen, is a vital part of human identity. Religious exercise provides strength and comfort in a, in a pandemic, in the stresses of a pandemic. It motivates service to others in schools and other agencies. Credible legal threats to religious freedom aggravate our already dangerous polarization. 
Now, as much as ever, it's vital to defend religious freedom for all. Despite some mixed signals, the current Supreme Court seems willing to shoulder that task. But to defend religious freedom credibly means recognizing rights for others too. That calls for something I haven't yet mentioned. That is conservative Christians supporting full religious liberty and equality for Muslims too. It calls for confronting rather than avoiding the problems of racial justice and inequality. And it calls for drawing careful lines so that LGBT people, LGBT people can participate in economic life and religious organizations and individuals can follow their religious identity as well. I'll stop there. Thank you. Professor Berg, you have certainly uh, struck a chord. There are a large number of questions and I'll try to get to as many as I can. So I'll try to keep your, your answers short if you can so we can get to as many of them. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, the, the, the Morrissey and Beale uh, cases. Um, what's significant in the minds of many there is that this was a seven to two decision. So this is not one uh, in which the outcome is, is on the edge of the knife and likely to change regardless of who is elected president. Uh, does that uh, give you comfort in terms of the size of the majority in, that, in those cases this year? Uh, yes, and the, and the previous ministerial exception decision was nine to nothing. So this is a, an exception that um, seems pretty firmly grounded and, and cuts across um, both liberals and conservatives. Uh, the, uh, Justice Breyer and Kagan are the two who, who, who support it um, strongly. And um, that, 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 you know, that is comforting. Now, when we start getting beyond uh, uh, people who can plausibly describe, be described as religious leaders or ministers, then the consensus breaks down uh, as to other employees. Um, but, but yeah, that's a strong, um, that's a strong seven to two verdict. I think it reflects the fact uh, that um, all religious organizations, not just conservative Christians who are the ones who, you know, raise raise hackles across political, political lines, but all religious organizations have this interest in being able to choose their leaders without uh, oversight by civil courts. One, one of the concerns that uh, have been raised about the, the ministerial exception is its application to those who are not of the same faith as the organization. Uh, the, the thought that if a Catholic school limits teachers to, be, to other Catholics, there's something appropriate about it, uh, uh, have, exercising independence in terms of employment. But if a religious organization hires those who are not of the same faith, doesn't that already begin to speak to uh, the, the lack of those fitting into a ministerial category? Yeah, I think that's one of the, that's one of the criteria that you ought not to use. It may, be an, it may be an indicator that this is not a, 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 a minister, but the question is, what does the person do? And here's why it's a bad factor to consider on its own. Um, for one thing, there are ecumenical oriented religious organizations that believe that their tenets cut across faiths and can be taught by people of other faiths. Progressive Christian organizations or ecumenical organizations may be perfectly happy to have a Jewish teacher uh, or a Muslim teacher and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so you would be discriminating against those organizations that thought that their, their teachers, their leaders could actually be from a different faith and yet still uh, promote the, value, the, the, the fundamental religious values of that organization. I don't think we want to it discourage organizations from being ecumenical. It also might um, affect uh, minority faiths because particularly in, in certain areas of the country, it may be difficult to find someone uh, or sufficient staff who are of your faith and yet they still may have very important roles uh, in, the, uh, in the organization. So it's a bad factor and it's, it was right for the court to reject that as a factor. So I want to ask you now two questions, uh, kind of from the opposite approach about the polarization uh, that we're experiencing now. One is that uh, the some of the uh, protesters in the uh, racial justice protests have attacked religious symbols. There have been 
uh, fires set in churches, including in the, uh, uh, the Basilica here in uh, uh, Minneapolis. Uh, there have been uh, uh, at, the, at the protests in Portland, in addition to burning the flag, Bibles were burned by protesters. Um, what, why is it that you're seeing a, a certain anti-religious theme in some of these protests? Not, not the mainstream Black Lives Matter protests, to be sure, but some of those that have become a little bit more radical. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know the specific, the specific circumstances. Um, to some extent, you just have, right, you have the opportunistic uh, looters or rioters or the person who sets a fire that's been associated with the protests, although not the driving force of the protest. Um, but, or that's happened during the protests. Um, the other thing is there's, there is a kind of protest against a close alliance of uh, conservative uh, uh, Christians with the Trump administration. That, that is, you can argue that both ways. You can argue that this is a, a terrible decision by conservative churches to throw in with, with uh, racism. Or you can argue that for because of other issues like abortion and gay rights, Donald Trump has been the only defender of religious freedom that those uh, folks could find. And so they have not compromised, but uh, rather have out of necessity um, voted for a person who would enable them to, to, to continue to carry out their ministries. Um, but it's inevitably going to be part then of the of the critique, the, 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 you know, the harsh critique of the existing state of things in an America where Donald Trump is, is president. So some people are going to go after then Bibles and go after uh, Christianity. Um, it's freedom of speech. Uh, and uh, as long as it doesn't lead to, vi to violence or, or attacks on the churches themselves, it's, uh, it's protected. Burning one's Bible is clearly protected speech, just like burning the flag is. Obviously, attacking or burning St. John's Church is not. There's, a, there's I promised a question from the other uh, uh, side of the, uh, the spectrum, uh, that the polarization that we're experiencing is increased by a lot of suspicious and skepticism about the COVID-related uh, public health measures by those who are on the conservative religious side. Why is that? Well, um, again, I think you could um, you could probably um, list a number of things. Um, in the early part of the pandemic, it was te it tended to uh, be on the coasts where people had come come in from other countries, hadn't reached the heartland, which are, tends to be more red. Um, but then there's just uh, the dynamics of polarization as well. I mean, if the president thinks that this is not a big deal, then I'm going to think it's not a big deal. Or if MSNBC says this is a big deal, I'm going to I'm going to think it's a big deal. Now, it is a big deal. So, uh, but and so there's there's a there's a medical truth about this for sure. But the degree of of uh, Skepticism uh, is, um, is, I think, a product of our polarization. You see the same thing uh, here as in other things. If the liberals are for it, I'm against it. That's so I want to go back all the way to the, the beginning where, where we started. Uh, uh, questions about whether there are any lessons in terms of religious liberty to be learned from prior episodes. This is not the first pandemic that uh, the United States has experienced. We particularly are familiar with the Spanish flu of 1918. Um, were there any episodes involving restrictions of religious worship uh, from which we can uh, gain precedent or learn something from that period? Yeah, I mean, in fact, churches were closed for, for short periods of time during the, during the Spanish flu. There's an interesting article um, uh, about the closure of churches in the District of Columbia 
And it, what's what's quite interesting this is in the fall of 1918 when the pandi that that pandemic hit its height, churches were closed for about a month in the District of Columbia as the thing swept around the uh, around the nation. And the arc was quite similar to the arc that we had had here, which is in the early first couple of weeks, churches complied with orders, as most churches have complied now. But after a few weeks, the church council, which church councils meant a lot more then than they do now in our radically pluralistic, uh, individualistic, decentralized religious life. But the church council of DC said, you need to reopen the churches because they are vital, especially, especially in the stress of this flu epidemic People need comfort. They need to be able to pray together and so on. Of course, they didn't have Zoom sessions then either. Uh, so um, yes, it's, these dynamics have played out. I'd say, I'd say in 1918, they played out in a less polarized time in which uh, religion was not perceived by too many people as being on only one side of the political uh, spectrum. And that's part of the polarization that we have now. So, so let me ask a question that pushes back a little at what you just said. You, you said at one point that uh, we are more polarized as a nation than we have been in the last 60 years. Uh, so in other words, in the post-World War II era. But there certainly have been periods of great polarization in American history before, including a civil war. Uh, and prior to World War II, there were uh, riots and violence. We have, we've faced these things before. Is polarization really just another, a, a returning to the mean, so to speak, that Americans in general have been rather sharply divided throughout our history? Um, yes, although, I mean, to say, well, we had a civil war before with 750,000 people dead is not a lot of comfort that, this, that uh, you know, it's, it's happened before. Um, and, and yeah, um, Polar's division is, is certainly part of the, the state of America. I think there, there, are, there are questions today about whether the political system and our, our institutions in general are up to managing that polarization because of the delegitimization of institutions, uh, government, uh, universities, the church, uh, the police, you know, lots of institutions in society, people are fundamentally questioning and their, their kind of ability to manage and reach any kind of synthesis of, of views, uh, I think is in some, you know, some doubt now. Um, but, uh, you know, time, time will tell uh, and uh, hopefully we won't get to, you know, something as serious as, uh, as the Civil War, which brought about the end of slavery at the cost of 750,000. Uh, returning to the discussion about uh, providing uh, benefits to, uh, to, to pay the salary of clergies uh, from uh, nonprofit organizations that have suffered during the pandemic, uh, a, a number of folks have pointed out that there is precedent for paying clergy from the government. We do have chaplains in the armed forces. Uh, how does that uh, precedent uh, relate to this situation? Yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, it's directly applicable. Applicable the 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 government paying clergy and uh, uh, like chaplains in the armed forces, and then sort of overseeing them and giving them orders about what their uh, what kind of services they ought to uh, pro provide and so on. That's truly unique, and is is a result of the fact that ser service members. Um, if they didn't have chaplains, they wouldn't be able to exercise their religion if they were posted in remote places around the world where they don't have access to their uh, to their churches. So the military chaplain is a different thing, I think. What it does show is that we don't have a strict uh, notion of separation of church and state. We don't insist on sort of this rigid line uh, where uh, government uh, funding uh, serves the purposes of religious equality and religious liberty, uh, we, we, have, we have allowed it. And uh, I think this is a different uh, example than the military chaplain, but, but fits under that general idea that separation is not the most fundamental value among our, our church state values.
we're, we're running short on time, but if you're willing to stay with us for another five minutes or so, I'd, I'd like to finish up with three questions coming back to the uh, uh, ministerial exception. Um, one is to point out that this, ex this exception would also, could also be used by organizations that uh, we do not think positively of. Wouldn't it allow uh, the KKK, for example, which identifies itself as a religious organization, to engage in discrimination based on the ministerial exception? Uh, yeah, and I think probably even outside of the ministerial exception, uh, the KKK has prob probably has some rights to engage in discrimination with respect to its leadership. Um, the, there are separate line of cases about freedom of association of organizations uh, to pick their, uh, their leaders where that discrimination is bound up with the message of the organization, as it probably would be with the KKK. That freedom has costs uh, and um, some protection for racist organizations would be one of those costs. Uh, once the organization goes beyond that and into other kinds of racial discrimination, then the, the, you know, the sort of fundamental nature of religious equality kicks in and rejects any exemptions. Uh, but uh, leadership, uh, protection of the right to choose leaders is probably there for, for secular organizations as well as, as religious organizations. In, in terms of uh, uh, those who are the employees of religious organizations, do religious organizations have a duty to inform them of their more limited rights? Is that something that a state could properly uh, expect, or at least the religious organization morally ought to, to let their employees know you do not have the same uh, uh, rights in terms of anti-discrimination laws that you would have in a secular setting, uh, and if you choose then to be employed by us, then you've uh, uh, consented or, or at least uh, acknowledged that that is something that you understand. Yeah, we don't have a, a sort of a ruling from the court that would tell us for certain about that, but there's certainly uh, an argument that these uh, some sort of notice should be uh, provided. Of course, the more the more stringent that notice uh, is um, the more it would be requiring an organization to uh, kind of lay out precisely what it will uh, do um, and, and what the employee can't do and can do, and that itself w would um, w would end up restricting the, the the organization's autonomy because no organization can predict every situation that's going to arise. Um, but you know, there, I think there's room for some argument about a, a general kind of notice to employees that that the organization is going to regard them as ministers, and that might be part of of a, of a, of a uh, meaning of of, a, of, a, of an appropriate test for ministers. Has the organization identified this person as a minister? And good practices for religious organizations would provide that notice to employees and would state that these employees, such and such employees serve important religious functions, which is the test that the, comes out of these cases. That's not only good for fair treatment of the employees, but also strengthens the organization's case if it comes to court that it has actually treated this person like a minister. The features that that the court rejected in these cases about formal title, formal training, must be a member of the, of the denomination. Those I think are properly rejected. Notice is a little bit harder as long as it uh, doesn't get, wouldn't, didn't become too stringent. One last question. Um, most of the ministerial uh, exception cases have involved teachers at uh, religiously affiliated schools. Uh, everyone seems to acknowledge that uh, choosing the actual pastor of a church is, is not really on the table. Um, so doesn't the ministerial exception then primarily benefit more wealthy people who can afford to put their children into private schools uh, and leave those who uh, uh, don't have the resources to pay tuition in a private school outside of the benefits of this important religious liberty protection? <laughs> 
Uh, so the benefit to the um, family using the school is indirect. I guess you could say it's a benefit that by preserving the school's ability to maintain a distinct identity, that's what the parents have are in at least in many cases uh, paying for. So there's that kind of indirect benefit. And if, with that said, I guess the answer is yes. Um, that that is a benefit for people who can uh, who can afford private schooling. The answer then would come in the other line of decisions that we're ta we talked about today, uh, where the state may uh, include religious schools in choice programs for private schooling. And in fact, if it enacts such a program, it uh, can't exclude religious schools from it. Um, so if, we, if we're thinking about sort of the poor, you know, the, the low income family versus the higher income family uh, and private schooling, uh, that would suggest that the remedy would be school choice. That's all we have time for today. I apologize to those whose questions I couldn't get to. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Berg, and please stay tuned to the Murphy Institute webpage and your email for information about upcoming, uh, 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 upcoming presentations in this series. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.